what exactly is Advent. In a word, Advent means coming. Some church groups, Christian traditions, call themselves Adventist. We don't exactly choose to use that name, but we would say we are Adventist in a very real sense of the word. Because Adventist simply means we believe in the second coming of Christ, even based upon the first coming of Christ. So the Advent season is a season of remembering. It is a season of expecting. It is a season, is a season of preparing to observe and remember the first Advent of Christ. But it has a twofold purpose. It is not only remembering the first advent of Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, it is, I guess we've already said, looking forward to the second advent, the second coming of Christ. So it's a very hopeful season. As we anticipate, based upon the surety of the first coming of Christ, that he will come again. I like to think it is best summarized, <clears throat> excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 which says this, So also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's where I get excited, especially this time of year. We know he came the first time he dealt with the issue of sin. That's why we have anything at all to celebrate, because he paid the price for sin. And so because that issue is settled, then we eagerly wait for him to come a second time to bring salvation. And we long for that day, do we not? Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's what Advent is about. And I in particular want to thank Rachel and Delina and Jane for their work in planning these Advent services. Jane, in particular, has planned these family Advent segments that are included in our service each Sunday that revolve around the theme, The Weary World Rejoices. I've been thinking about that theme a lot in recent days and weeks, thinking that it is a very, very pertinent theme in the times that we live in. It is a weary world that we live in. And you know, no matter what the year has held, it seems like celebrations and gift giving characterize this season of year. So indeed, the weary world does rejoice. However, I think the weary world rejoices largely in ignorance. They are largely clueless as to why they rejoice. We can characterize ourselves many times as a weary people, and we rejoice, but we know why we rejoice. And so we have much to celebrate as we rejoice. I did say that we are a weary people because in a real sense, we are, all of us. We are a weary people. And I don't need to elaborate on all the reasons why we are weary. Every one of us have experienced enough disappointment and heartache in life to be well aware that we are a weary people. And we identify with this world in this age that is characterized by its weariness. Because in a sense there is a, a heavy dark cloud that hangs over all of civilization and all of the world. Because all of us, whether we're born again or not, we live with a legacy of Adam and Eve's sin in the perfect garden paradise. Genesis 3, verses 17 to 19 tell us God's words to Adam. He said, the ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow, until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, you, for you are dust, and you will return to dust. Those words give us cause to be weary, don't they? That curse hangs over us. That is the reality of this present age. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 23 tell us, 
the Apostle Paul writing, says that the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So I gather that there's a whole lot of groaning that's going on. Groaning by the natural world, as Paul tells us. Groaning within ourselves, especially within ourselves as those who have the, the first fruits, the Spirit of God within us. We know what is to come, and we can hardly wait for it to come. And so we eagerly anticipate the day when this worn out, decaying, aging body will be transformed in an instant into a glorious, immortal body. And so there is a whole lot of groaning going on as both nature waits and as we wait for our redemption. As we said, the natural world is under a curse and it groans along with us to be set free. We groan for immortality at the, at the return of Christ. And so the natural world, in a sense, hopes to be set free. As the people of God, we hope to be set free. And because of the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, we will be set free. And so that is our very real hope. And we focus on that theme of hope today. And I love biblical hope. That means so very, very much to me. I am literally passionate about biblical hope. Enough so that I wrote a little book <clears throat> some time ago entitled Hope for Uncertain Times. I don't write things all that profound, but if you don't mind, I'd like to quote myself from that book because I think it applies. Real hope is to life what water is to a wilted plant in part soil. Hope refreshes and revives amidst the scorching harshness of life. Hope promises something better when life events and circumstances indicate otherwise. Hope shouts optimism in a gloomy world of pessimism. It gives a glimpse of something hidden from the eyes of those without it. Hope stands as a solitary figure against gale force winds, not budging or giving up so much as an inch of ground. When all turn tail and run, Hope stands and thrives amidst even the most hopeless circumstances. Real hope does not leave us pawns in the hands of circumstances because true hope transcends circumstances. The ability to survive and thrive amidst uncertain times is solidly based on substantive hope. Hope that is far more than wishful thinking and starry-eyed optimism. Those are things I passionately believe with all of my heart. And so as a weary people in a weary world, we are overcomers because of the great hope that is set before us. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 24 and 25 tell us that now in hope we were saved. Yet hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. It is the nature of hope that we don't yet have it, even though we can, we can touch it and taste it and see it and smell it in a real sense. It's just a bit out of reach. So we might say that hope is just around the corner, but we're not there with it yet. And so hope is near, but hope is not here yet. 
We have not yet realized it, so we strive for it. We press on for the realization of that hope that God has promised to us. We continue on because we want to realize the hope that God has given to us. Thinking about our Thanksgiving service, which was only a few days ago, but seems like maybe months ago, this past Wednesday evening, and I had a lot to be hopeful for as I experience the things that were shared. That had to be the most meaningful Thanksgiving Eve service that I've been a part of in my time as your pastor. There were some very moving testimonies that were shared by many of you, and I was thinking in particular many of you who are new to our fellowship and some wonderful things that were shared. I also was reminded of what was shared concerning some of the faithful servants who've been a part of Lakeshore over the years that we lost to the enemy death in the past year. And I say that I'm hopeful because it all reminded me that Jesus, the head of the church, is raising up a new generation to pick up where others have left off. And so we are hopeful at the movement of God's people throughout the ages. We are a hopeful people as we look to the future, reminded of Jesus' great words in Matthew 16, verse 18, when he said to Peter, On this rock I will build my church and the forces of Hades will not overcome it. There will not be a day when the last Christian will be dead. The movement continues on in a hopeful direction. So indeed we are a triumphant people. We are a people moving forward in faith as we reach the goal of the hope that is set before us. And so we eagerly and we patiently press on because of our faith and again because of the hope before us. Romans 8 verses 26 and 27 tell us that in the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness. Because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In our groaning, sometimes we don't know how to pray, do we? Sometimes in, in the worst of the human experience, when we see the worst that there can be, we, we maybe are able to, to get the words out with groaning, your kingdom come, because we see how bad it is. And so sometimes we can squeeze out those words, but there are other times when we are absolutely speechless. And we don't know how to pray. We just are groaning so deeply within and how encouraging it is to know that the Spirit of God, the Spirit inseparably joined to our Father that represents the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives, that Spirit communicates in a language that we may not be able to verbalize ourselves. I'm thankful for that. We don't know what to say to God sometimes in the midst of the world's groanings and our own groanings. But God's Spirit conveys those thoughts, those longings, those feelings. They are faithfully conveyed to our Father when we cannot verbalize it. For those reasons, we have hopeful confidence according to Romans 8, 28, which follows and says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. God has a circle of good. There's times we don't understand God's circle of good, do we? Sometimes that circle of good just doesn't seem very good. But what an amazing Father we have that takes the circumstances of life, no matter how we qualify them, He takes those circumstances, He weaves them into the greatest good in our lives. And many times we're left to wonder, why is it that God's greatest good and His best work is accomplished through hardship and suffering. More times than not, it is true. And the greatest example that we have of that has to be the suffering and the death of Jesus our Lord. The absolute greatest work ever done by the hand of God was done through the most intense suffering ever of His precious only Son, our Lord and Savior. That's the prototype. That's the example. So we realize God really does weave all things together for the good 
of those that love him that are called according to his purpose. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 7 tell us, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. I love that phrase, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, the Advent hope. That as we go through difficulties, as we go through trials that, that work to make us better individuals, refining us, that all of that so that they eventually result in praise, glory, and honor at the time when Jesus is revealed at his second coming. And so that is the process which we are involved in. And so through the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we are told, we are born again into a living hope. Again, I just love that phrase. We rejoice in what lies before us, even though for the short time, as the Apostle Peter calls it, we struggle through various trials and difficulties as our faith is being refined. It indeed works together for the greatest good in all of our lives. I firmly believe that our greatest good is to prepare us, for God to prepare us through Jesus to rule the world in the coming age when Jesus Christ returns. Do not lose sight of that precious fact and truth. That's the greatest good that he's weaving in our lives right now. He's taking us as ordinary and plain individuals. As a weary people, he's taking the circumstances of our lives, he's weaving it into something beautiful so that we will be ready to rule the world when Christ returns. Is there anything more precious and exalted than what he has planned for us to be able to do that? It excites me. It gives me reason to get out of bed in the morning. I'm training along with you to rule the world with Christ when he returns. So with that thought in mind, have you ever considered that that difficult job that you may have or the home and family challenges that you might be facing or the health issues in your life, that all of those just might be opportunities to be trained and prepared to be used of Jesus in his coming government? What a, a radical and amazing thought. If he's working all things together for the good, he's taking all those things, all, even that brokenness, and preparing you so you can rule the world with Christ when he comes back. He's in the business of building kingdom character into your life. And he's doing a lot of that through adversity, raising you up as a witness that is winsome to those who are outside of Christ so they can be drawn in and they can share in that wonderful hope and future as well. That's what he's doing in us. I'm reminded of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. How he prepared people for the coming of Jesus into the world the first time. Isaiah the prophet predicted concerning him. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled. And every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight. The rough way smooth. And everyone will see the salvation of God. This season of year, may we be reminded that we are the voice in the wilderness that is calling out. Calling out to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. As we observe his birth, as we remember his birth, we have that great role that we're standing out in. Many times it feels like a lonely voice in the wilderness, as if you're the only one. But that's what you're shouting out and sharing with others. Prepare the way. Get your life in order. Get ready for the Lord to come. Because we are Adventist. We believe that he is coming 
again. Indeed, the weary world rejoices this season of year as it does every year, but as I said, I believe the world is largely ignorant of why it is rejoicing. There is a day coming when all people and even nature itself will fully rejoice. The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It will blossom abundantly and will also rejoice with joy and singing. They will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. So strengthen the weak hands and steady the shaking knees. And say to the cowardly, be strong and do not fear. And then the eyes of the blind will be opened. And the ears of the deaf unstopped. And the lame will leap like a deer. And the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah 35, 1 to 6. The weary world and God's weary people will truly rejoice. Because that is our great hope. Amen.